So my background is in landscape architecture. It's also in planning. Um, I was a student of McCarg's at Penn and in their planning program, uh, student of landscape architecture at Penn State. What I'd like to do today is to talk about three things. One is give you a little insight into Philadelphia University, why we did what we did and where we are in the process. Talk about geodesign, but I'm not going to give you a def definition. I'm going to tell you what it means to us and then talk a bit about curriculum and maybe say a few things about why I'm excited about what you all are doing here, and I assume that you're all excited about it too. <clears throat> so, um, Philadelphia University began in the late 1800s. It's a very small private university in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, the fifth largest city in the country, in the US that is. Um, it was founded principally by this person, Theodore Search, Ted as the students like to call him after the cafeteria in uh, one of our student unions. Um, Search was interested in textile and he was part of the centennial, the first World's Fair that happened in 1876 in Philadelphia. He was also the managing director for the Stetson Company, probably most famous for hats, uh, or that you would know them for. Uh, but he, what he saw was that Europe was way ahead of the US in what you were doing with textiles, in design, in manufacturing, in everything from chemistry to processes. And so he thought, how can we change that in the US? And so they started this uh, small university, college at the time, called Textile. It became known as Textile. Uh, right now, it has about 4,000 students, come from 45 states, 40 countries. The average class size is about 18, student uh, to faculty ratio 12 to 1. These are some of our geodesign master students hard at work in our summer project. The campus is about 100 acres, about half a square kilometer. Uh, this on the left side, that large gray cancerous area, is uh, the city of Philadelphia. It's 140 square miles, about 360 square kilometers. The largest city, certainly, in the state of Pennsylvania. It's in the southeast corner. And the university occupies, as I said, about 100 acres adjacent to the largest managed urban park in the world. That's the Wissahickon branch that you see there, uh, the green area. It comprises about 10% of the city. We're not into bikes like you're into bikes, uh, but we're trying. We're trying really hard. This is a small um, restaurant right along the riverfront in East Falls, which is where, again, where the university is. And it is a node along about a 60 mile or 100 kilometer path that goes from Philadelphia to the suburban area that is principally for, bicycle, for bikes. We don't integrate it into the urban fabric like you do so well here. Faculty, 130 full-time, 450 part-time. I was part-time for about eight years teaching in landscape architecture, principally grading and GIS. So um, we have three uh, colleges in the university. So ours is the College of Architecture and Built Environment, but we also have the College of Design, Engineering, and Commerce, DEC as they call it, and then also Science, Health, and Liberal, Liberal Arts. This is our campus. These are the buildings where our college, principal buildings where our college is located. It's not one of the buildings I work at. Actually, I do work in that first one, the Seed Center. Seed being sustainability, engineer, uh, energy efficiency, and design, um, and the architecture and design building. That houses uh, geodesign, architecture, sustainable design, architectural design, technology, construction management, and so on. All part of the College of Architecture and Built Environment. Big thing about the university is the idea of nexus learning. So this is the idea that learning from the student's perspective is going to be active, collaborative, and interdisciplinary. So active in that it's experiential, service-based learning work on real projects, 
uh, tackling real problems. We have clients, we have stakeholders, they're often communities and community organizations and multiple community organizations. And there is a, a studio experience where we bring together collaborators. Uh, these are professionals, practitioners, they're uh, educators, they're other students, they're technologists. Come together and tackle these real world problems. And it's also interdisciplinary. So these are things that you've heard over and over again and, and a lot of things that you practice here. What I would like to see and what we try to do at the university is to collaborate and include these allied design professions and disciplines, landscape architecture, architecture, and, and so on. Uh, we don't have all of those programs at the university. So I'm very envious, envious about what you all are doing here. Um, so let's talk about geodesign for a second. In 2010, I went to the geodesign, first geodesign summit out in Redlands at the Esri campus. Um, they were all there and learned about this idea for the first time. Now, having studied with McCarg, we sort of had an idea of what he was trying to do. And when I was there in the early 90s, he had still not used GIS in the classroom. We were the first class to, to do that. Uh, we were using CAD. So it was a little bit of a challenge, and it was a bit of a surprise after I had learned what GIS was and how well it lent itself to that type of approach. So come back to the university. I had been teaching there as an adjunct, again, in landscape architecture for several years, and proposed an idea. Uh, they saw it as either a lab or a center for excellence or maybe a program, maybe a certificate. But they decided, the university decided, on a one-year master's program in geodesign, specifically in geodesign, connected to landscape architecture. So the other disciplines that we collaborate with, uh, again, are architecture, sustainable design, which is a lot about architecture, um, construction management. But they wanted it connected to landscape architecture because landscape architects have the broad vision, right? They consider context. Um, so came back and proposed this idea, the university being small, fairly agile, was able to get this program in place in about a year and a half. So we worked hard to do that, came up with a curriculum. It's very quick, and we're still in, a, we're still sort of feeling things out. But so far, having the first year uh, under our belts, as they say, uh, it's going pretty well. So what do we consider geodesign to be? Well, it, of course, includes uh, geospatially enabling design. So it's uh, location aware, it's intelligence, analytical, it's visual, all of those things. And it's specifically targeting the allied design profession. So architecture, landscape, architecture, planning, and engineering. That is our target student demographic also. But it also includes some things that are very specific. Um, 3D. We want everything to be, as much as possible, in 3D. We understand 3D better, it's more intuitive. Technology-based, and there's a broad spectrum there. Uh, Data-driven, scale-driven to some degree, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, Design-centric, so this idea of, uh, that Bill Miller had of zero impedance. We want this technology to be useful to designers and not just backroom technology. Uh, rapid iteration, test, retest, retest, retest. We've heard this several times. And also immersive and realistic as much as possible. So this umbrella of geodesign is pretty broad, much like the umbrella of landscape architecture. There are some institutions that specialize in areas of landscape architecture. The same can be said about geodesign. And our specialization, if you will, for geodesign is um, well, first of all, it's collaborative and interdisciplinary. We get that from the university. We get that from geodesign itself. We see it at the intersection of all of these professions. Um, we don't see it as its own field. It is 
collaborative. Now, this is this is from a workshop that um, that I participated in out at the Geodesign Summit a few years ago, and was something that Esri was very interested in at the time, still is. Um, and we started to implement this at the university. So this thing right here, this GIS data warehouse, I should also say, for full disclosure, I was the GIS director for the city of Philadelphia for about 15 years. Um, that said, came from a design background, design and planning background. I worked in private practice for a lot of years, then went into city government to, um, uh, to work in GIS for a large municipality. So we worked a lot with data, we worked a lot across various departments. Um, this is something that was important to the city. So the idea that you could store data that was important to you in sort of a read-only way. So to give access via the net, whether it's your internal network or coming in from the outside, but to a central warehouse where you're gonna store data and retrieve it, right? But then have some place to store the content of what you're doing. So then you have here a interdisciplinary design team that's using all of this that's being maintained by these guys here and sharing it out with your stakeholders and getting feedback and eventually then being able to take this into a, to a point where it can be visualized and it can be measured. So can your success, can what you're doing be measured as well as visualized? So this is, this is what we're implementing at the university and this is what we try hard to involve all of our collaboration teams on. This is another one, another uh, idea uh, pirated from Esri that, and Eric Whitner specifically, um, and I think it's a great diagram because uh, GIS has typically been, traditionally been really strong in this area and most, most comfortable on this side of the spectrum. So large areas of high complexity and low precision, right? Whereas, a lot of designers, and I'll include engineers uh, in that bunch, are interested mostly in this side, and GIS has been much less comfortable on that side. So what we're doing, or we're trying to do, is focus on this side, and not so much on this side. And there are a lot of reasons for that I'll get into in just a minute, but this idea that as you move left here, you increase in precision and decrease in complexity, but then all of a sudden you have this opportunity to do things in 3D. And, and that's actually changing uh, pretty rapidly too, where 3D is now starting to expand out into the regional scale. Again, the idea of rapid iteration is very important, being able to do something, test the outcome, uh, read the outcome, do it again, do it again, do it again. 3D is important because it's a lot easier for me to explain to my client or my stakeholder this way than it is this way. They understand, they get it because it's more intuitive. We understand the impact better of something and what's around it than trying to, to uh, uh, get that message across this way. It's also technology driven. This is our platform. <laughs> There's one thing left out of this, but for the most part, it's there. Uh, central is, so first of all, we're on the desktop, we're online, and we're in the cloud. So this is a lot of desktop software, this one excluded. Um, so central to us is uh, City Engine, it's kind of the bucket that everything ends up in. Um, this takes on a lot of the processing and certainly a lot of the analysis. This is not, uh, per se, an analytical environment. Um, this enhances it. This puts it online. This is easy. And so a lot of the students and others sort of gravitate to it. These are useful but a little tougher um, and need some kind of a uh, um, translation and now we're starting to see gaming come into the picture. Okay, start with the desktop. Principally, we're using, uh, we're, we're an Esri shop. 
Um, I'm going to back up for one second and say that we, these are all COTS products, commercial off-the-shelf software, right? We have a site license at the university for all of them, so no matter where you are in a lab or on your personal PC, this thing is uh, required uh, equipment for our geo-design program, having a laptop of this capability, which is mostly around the graphics card and system memory and that kind of thing. We're very mobile. We can go anywhere we want, and we can collaborate in a, uh, a number of ways, but we always do come together physically in the, um, in the studio. Again, at the desktop and this idea of being able, I mean, there have been a lot of processes that are in, in place for a long time, right? Model Builder's been there for a long time, uh, developed by Bill Miller and his team. Um, and it shortcuts things. It allows you to combine processes. And one could consider it to be a technological platform for geodesign if you have the wherewithal, the GIS skill set, and so on. But not everyone does or wants to. This is an example, actually, one that Tom used in his talk this morning of the green roof suitability. I'm going to go into this uh, tomorrow in a bit more detail. But this was a student project in GIS, not in geodesign. It was about uh, assessing the impact of um, green roofs, specifically on stormwater runoff, because we treat in Philadelphia, about two thirds of the city treats its stormwater in the sewage treatment plants, and we don't want to be doing that. Um, we want to be able to reduce that demand on the sewage treatment plant. And so that was one, one way that one of our advanced GIS, a group in our advanced GIS class, uh, um, approached that. So, City Engine, again, desktop, but it does have now this online component that you can share information, collaborate, and get feedback from uh, stakeholders. We're pretty excited about that. This is an example of a student project uh, from last year, uh, about a year ago this time, actually, in Germantown, a small um, um, commercial corridor inside the city of Philadelphia. So this idea of, uh, I think Michael alluded to this, SaaS, uh, software as a service. The idea is that you don't have any software running here. You're, you have a browser running, basically. You're connected to a server somewhere. It has software. It also has great access to data, data discovery out on the web. And so you're consuming data. You're not having to provide it, necessarily. You're consuming services and you have software running and it helps you as a designer. So this is uh, one example. So this was now, I guess, the current incarnation for uh, what started out to be the first GeoDesign online tool and then became GeoPlanner. So uh, again, we've heard a bit about this this morning. So you have instant access to data, no software on your computer and you have some capability in the way of a dashboard. I'm going to read out uh, uh, good or bad, you know, better or worse, um, see the impact of my decisions. I'm going to do a, just run through a quick video. I was going to do a live uh, uh, demonstration, but then I chickened out. Um, so I have actually videos on this uh, machine. When you're watching this, keep in mind no data on my computer, no software on my computer. Um, and this is going to go through a scenario where it's a, it's a very quick site plan with parking and with a building, right? Don't think of it as parking in a building. Think of it, try to think of this as to, to broaden the application of this to a lot of the things that you're doing. But it's the idea of this, OK? These videos are available online, by the way. So what, what the person is doing here is they've gone to a site, and you can go anywhere in the world. We did one in Saudi Arabia the other day. You can access data. Um, the degree to which, I mean, the, the, the quality of the data, it, it, it varies. But um, you have some tools that allow you to uh, start to get at this idea of what we're seeing are some parameters. 
So parametric modeling, right? So you're able to set some parameters. And what the person did here was they drew this square. They defined it in the software as sort of an object. It's a parking lot. And they agreed on some parameters here. And those parameters can be anything from the size of a parking space to, to the cost of materials. And then once you hit the little solver button there, it generates a parking lot for you. It just takes a guess, right? It says, here's, here's what I think you want based on the parameters that you've stipulated. It ends up uh, generating 448 parking spaces and in these configurations and, these, and this all changes um, as you fool with this a little bit. So they just changed 90 degrees to 60 degrees. We're gonna change the perimeter. All of that is going to change dynamically, right? And so this, in the hands of someone that understands design and understands what you need to do in order to get to construction, uh, it's pretty powerful. Introducing a building or another object into this and having it react instantly. So this, if I do this, this is what's gonna happen. If I do that, that's what's gonna happen type of thing is actually pretty exciting. Um, I wanna show you one more thing quickly. So this is now the, uh, ne the next module. That was the site layout module. This is a grading module. So now they've laid out this site. Kind of looks like that. So you have commercial up here. You have residential throughout here. And I'm not asking you to agree that this is a great idea or great design. Just asking you to uh, hang with the idea of this for a few minutes and its potential for designers. So now we've moved into, and this is the, the interesting part here. We've moved into um, this part of the design process that is about experimentation. So you have an idea, move into experimentation, and then eventually you need to get that to construction drawings, right? If you want it to be built, okay, at this scale. So this is our dashboard and it reads out it would, with what the software is trying to do in Charlotte, North Carolina, by the way, is optimize your design for cut and fill and moving material around on site. And it reports out in real dollars, okay? So cubic yards, you've put in a parameter that it, where I'm working in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, or in Copenhagen, um, I'm paying $8.50 a cubic yard to move things around on site. It's actually going through doing the grading for you and it's reporting out on what you can expect your site cost to be. And it considers a lot in that. It considers subgrade, it considers compaction, a lot of, a lot of different things. Clearing, cut and fill, what happens if you put in a structure like a retaining wall, how does that, how does that change things? But it's, and it does it on the fly. I mean, you can make some decisions, you can place a wall, you can do all the things that we're used to as designers, but this will test it for you immediately and report out to you in dollars and cents. And in addition to volumetric units and show you a little bit what it looks like in 3D. So we use this in our summer studio, uh, actually spring and summer studio in landscape architecture and in geodesign. And one of the problems with this is that we're going back and forth between this environment, this SaaS environment, and desktop, right? And so that we have to, we have to solve. That problem we definitely need to solve. So that's one example. Another example is um, in, in some of the exciting things I, I, I see in, in technology and evolving pretty quickly is this Luminar T. It's a immersive, sort of a realistic add-on to um, things like City Engine and 3D Studio Max and SketchUp and so on that brings in movement and light and reflectivity and all of that. Some great videos online for that too. Uh, the other part about geodesign for us is that it is very data driven. We, we go, uh, we work hard at uh, having students understand the decisions they're going to have to make when they get out into the real world about where they get data, how much they pay for it, do they create it, can they purchase it, can they download it for free or access it for free. 
So um, we find that um, it is fairly cost-effective if you have aerial photography available um, to buy a commercial product. These are buildings that are generated by a company in California, Cyber City 3D. There are other alternatives, but this is one we've used for the Navy Yard. It is something that uh, is part of the decision-making process for us in a project. Do you purchase data? Do you build data? Um, how this works, it works first from aerial imagery, and there's aerial imagery, oblique or straight down, I'm sorry, not oblique, but orthogonal, straight down vertical imagery available in a lot of places. You can use that imagery to uh, compile things like buildings and other objects that eventually look like that. You can use oblique imagery, imagery shot at an angle, to do the same thing and end up with models that you can then also use the, that very imagery to texture. So not only are you building a 3D object, but you're texturing it so, to make it look somewhat realistic. Uh, LiDAR, huge. Um, mostly known from aerial sources and mostly used to develop digital terrain models and digital elevation models that uh, do anything from correct aerial imagery to uh, be able to define things in the landscape. And one of the things that's important for us, and the reason that we're venturing into this area of LIDAR, is that it can, very art it can articulate the landscape. You can capture quickly and relatively economically the nuances of the landscape and be able to represent that in a model. That's one of our areas of uh, great interest and in research, even though we're not a research institution. Um, this was, uh, these, these shots were made uh, when we last, late last spring, when we captured ground-based LIDAR in uh, two of our study sites and also for our campus. On the, sorry, on the left is a mobile unit, on the right <clears throat> is a static unit. These are a few of our students that are participating on a very cold and windy day down in the Navy Yard last spring uh, as we were about to do this mobile capture. This is some of the product. So this is a courtyard at the university. Um, it's very detailed from the ground level. It captures about five to 8,000 points per square meter, unlike the aerial stuff, which today high resolution is uh, between a foot and a half meter uh, per point. Here is one example. I'll show you this very model live. So this is I'm just going to zoom in here and manipulate this. This is just a portion of uh, a site that we scanned at the at one of our project sites this summer. But you can see the idea um, that we're we think has a lot of potential for, uh, and, and there are organizations using this for a number of things, everything from uh, inventory and surveying that would have taken months to perform that you can do in an afternoon uh, to um, assessment of things. So that's, uh, that's pretty high on our list of let's see where it goes. Um, you can do this inside and outside. We've done it, when I was with the city, we did a small pilot where we, did, we went underground into the subway system and regional rail and that type of thing into, uh, build, in, inside of buildings, capture a 3D representation. So essentially you get a 3D as-built drawing of your building or your underground structure in this semi-autonomous uh, mode, a spatial robot moving through that has an inertial measurement unit device on it that can track its movement and report back very accurately. Uh, this is a more elaborate version of that. It's a much more accurate version. Uh, that's actually, those shots are from when we uh, did the uh, capture in the subway. Okay, curriculum. So this was, this is part two of the presentation. <laughs> um, the university has had a landscape, landscape architecture program for about 10 years. It started as a five-year program and then went to a four-year program. Um, when it recently went to a four-year program is when we started the first uh, or the um, 
the one-year program, uh, master's program in geodesign. So now we have essentially a four plus one program for a student that wants to go through four years of landscape architecture education and one year of geodesign. So applying what they've learned and maybe focusing it in a much different way in that one year. Um, this is a look into the cur curriculum. It's pretty standard stuff. I would imagine yours is very similar. Uh, I'm just going to focus on this part here and this, these are the four years. Um, we've had from the beginning uh, GIS in the curriculum and oh, these four areas over here are broken down into technology on the bottom, then history, theory, design, representation, i.e. studios, and then electives on the top. So what I want to talk about for just a second uh, is how the landscape architecture program is set up, what now we do to uh, bring the students closer to an experience that we would call a geodesign experience and skill set, and then what some of the opportunities are. So this area down here, science and technology, uh, we introduced GIS in the second year, in the fall semester of the second year. So they have it a full year before they start into uh, the, uh, what we would call the, the upper level or advanced studios. But <clears throat> they're taking that um, just one semester prior to their first urban design studio. We have an advanced GIS class in the fall semester of year three. So by the time they get midway through the third year in their curriculum, they're pretty tuned into GIS and they're using it for a lot of things. Uh, mostly, they're enamored with the data that's available and data access and all of that and also the analytical part of it. But now then comes the heavy lifting, the, de the design part. Uh, also, I teach the, the grading classes, so intro grading and advanced grading. My interest there is in preparing students better for, to understand terrains, how to work with terrains, and not just terrains of existing landscapes, but if you do a site plan and you do a grading plan, then you can from that extract a proposed terrain and that terrain can be represented in a lot of the environments that we were talking about today, not the least of which is uh, City Engine. The Site Ops product can help with that proposed terrain, so you can actually export it. And then we've written a workflow that gets the information out of Site Ops, brings it through Collada, actually sketch up through Collada, and into ArcGIS, and ultimately into City Engine. That is possible. It's a little ridiculous, but it's possible. Um, and that's how we have to do it now, but hopefully that is going to change. We're going to try to push it in that direction. And then urban hydrology is also interesting to us. Uh, one of my first experiences with geodesign, I worked for a small um, land trust in southeastern Pennsylvania, and arguably the first time that I thought about a concept that was, that was essentially geodesign. Using GIS to assess large areas and calculate a water budget. So the, every component of the cycle, of the hydrologic cycle, and then model the impact that a change would have. Am I moving from one type of land use to another? What is the impact on the hydrologic model, but also including evapotranspiration? So if you understand soils and you understand how plants interact with soils and evapotranspiration potential, then you get the whole picture, and then you can solve for, for groundwater recharge. OK. Um, up here on the top, we have two electives that if the students want to move into geodesign from landscape architecture, their two electives would likely be one of these three courses. It's either going to be a sustainable design methodologies, which is cross-listed in our Master of Science in Sustainable Design, and it's kind of the found, one of the foundation courses for sustainable design. And the other is environmental policy. Uh, if you have some experience with sustainable design methodologies, then you could move in right into adaptive design um, as your other elective. This tier here, um, the opportunity there is in, we have three courses in landscape architecture history. Uh, there's the potential to maybe uh, take one of those and turn it into something else. If it were up to me, it would be a technology 
design technology sequence. Not only what, how to use technology, but how things interoperate and uh, interconnect. And then, of course, the studio. So uh, starting in the first GIS-influenced studio would be in the spring of year two, and that is the first urban design studio, followed by community design, urban restoration management, and then an inter the first interdisciplinary studio. So these are landscape architects working with architects and working on, it's the second urban design studio, and then a capstone. That's for landscape architecture. So, 138 credits for uh, BLA, another 36, but if you do both together, then you get that reduced to 27 from 36. You, at Philadelphia University, you pay by the credit. So everybody's watching the clock. Uh, this is our curriculum in geodesign. Um, it is studio-based. There's a studio sequence, so we have a small introductory studio in the fall, which is going on right now. Um, I should also say that this program, unlike landscape architecture, is geared at working professionals. So we run it on Saturdays and evenings. Um, the Saturday studios run in the fall half a day, in the spring and summer all day and uh, in the summer they are on site at our project site. Uh, let's see, we have two advanced GIS classes, so they get a pretty good grounding in uh, automation, so scripting, Python scripting, CGA scripting for City Engine. Uh, City Engine is the principal tool, again, it's the container that everything comes into, whether it's coming from CAD or 3D Studio Max or Maya or uh, ArcGIS, it all comes into, eventually ends up in City Engine. Um, the Spring Studio is the first um, practiced application studio. So we actually take a, a real project and um, with real stakeholders, a real client, and work through that. Then we repeat that process in the summer uh, for our second sort of practice-based studio. Uh, what else? We have a geodesign explorations class that uh, will change a little bit each year. And information modeling. Information modeling is mostly about um, CGA scripting, computer generated architecture. So scripting for City Engine that, that will make your life a lot easier if you do it, um, if you're using City Engine. Uh, I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but we, this is our uh, other significant curriculum. Um, in the Master of Science in Sustainable Design. That has been in place for, I think, about eight, nine years now. Uh, so it is a more mature uh, program. Um, it is a two-year program, and some of the students that we have do both the uh, master students, but do both geodesign and sustainable design. So, some successes. Um, Early in the, uh, in the going in, in landscape architecture, we required two GIS classes, an intro and an advanced, as I uh, talked about earlier. And this has gone a long way into having the students see the advantages of GIS in their, land, in their design studios as they reach those upper studios. We encourage other majors across the university at an undergraduate level to participate in the intro GIS class at least. Some of them go on to advance. So those include architecture, principally architecture, this uh, specialization called ADT or architectural design technology and uh, environmental conservation biology. The focus is on the urban landscape and it's on sustainable design and practices for the urban landscape and we are very interdisciplinary and, again, work on a real problem. So uh, in the areas of science and technology, uh, some opportunities. So first, introduce a, I think it's important that we start to restructure how we teach technology and introduce a sequence because that is something that is going to be valuable to students as they're trying to enter this professional world of design and take with them these geodesign uh, skill sets. So that includes the integration of GIS and CAD and building information modeling and things like SketchUp and parametric modeling and all of that. 
teaches them how to uh, leverage cloud solutions. So maybe that's Esri Business Analyst and Community Analyst, maybe it's ArcGIS Online, uh, maybe it's SiteOps and other things that are going to evolve in the same way SiteOps has or develop and, and, and evolve. And also how to go among these various commercial off-the-shelf products. That is very tricky stuff and um, not for the faint of heart. Um, grading terrains, uh, I, again, I, it, it's something that I'm kind of passionate about and understanding the terrain and objects in the terrain and, and what we as designers do and how we sculpt the landscape and how it performs. It could be stormwater management and, and in other ways, but, but that's pretty important. Um, infusing 3D design into our studios, requiring in the upper levels that students design in 3D. So that is something that we just started last year and it will be a growing process, much like geodesign is going to be a growing process over a, a rather long period of time. It has to evolve, has to mature. Um, again, cloud solutions for data and applications, uh, integrated technologies, and then collaboration with, uh, so these are our opportunities within our university. Uh, some of the programs we have there that we are looking to collaborate with in this coming year. Uh, animation is one. Interactive design and media, gaming. So we have a, an actual degree in that, and uh, that's something we're very much looking forward to, uh, to bringing collaborators into. This past year, we did collaborate with our disaster medicine management program. We supported a couple of field exercises, one up in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and one at the sports complex in Philadelphia during a live event. Uh, it was pretty interesting using iPads connected wirelessly to the cloud and the Esri uh, collector app. So they had a real-time feed of information coming into the command control center from the field, which was, uh, which was, was, was terrific, terrific experience for the students and, and for the university. Uh, they have a program in community and trauma counseling. So uh, events like Hurricane Sandy, I'm going to call it Hurricane Sandy, um, going in and understanding the implications of that and, and how we could potentially not only design for a different outcome but respond to things. Um, and then there's a, a in, in our College of Architecture and Built Environment, Photography and New Media, which is uh, pretty interesting. So here are some things that I heard yesterday about the University of Copenhagen that I'm extremely excited and can't wait to run back, not too soon, but eventually get back and talk about. Uh, urban landscape engineering, the concept, is just is, is fascinating. Urban and regional development. We have one of our geodesign students got a job with a company in Philadelphia um, that specializes in real estate and development and, and works with organizations, a lot of universities actually, and universities like Philadelphia University that are um, somewhat constrained about development. I mean, we have 100 acres, we're surrounded by residential, and we don't have any more land. Uh, and we're dealing with a lot of issues in the community. Uh, the concept of landscape architecture and urban design, and for me, geo design and urban design, uh, I, would, I would love to have an urban design program at the university. And I think that is a tremendous uh, collaboration potential. Human spatial behavior and move, movement. I thought that was uh, an incredible idea. So maybe going back to the William White ideas um, and how people react to the spaces between the buildings, right? How we live life between the buildings, as Jan Gill would say. Um, land use change detection. So something that uh, I was introduced to at the city of Philadelphia when I first started to uh, try to understand or get my head around the idea of 3D modeling and how would you do it. Up to that point, it was something that you did once and you barely could afford it then and if, it cha if something changed, how would you change it? You couldn't change it. I mean, it's just economically prohibitive. But now with the idea that you can use remotely sensed data to 
um, detect change in the landscape, if you set some parameters, you don't have to reconstruct your entire model. You just reconstruct the parts that changed, right? So now it's, it's a more sustainable practice in data capture and management. Collaboration opportunities here, such as with planning, totally envious. Geography and geoinformatics, totally envious. We do not have that. Engineering, um, forestry, particularly urban forestry, and again, urban design and natural resources. That's what I have. Thanks.